And I'd ask George to think that, you know, one of the things that's in prospect, in, in Iraq anyway, is that the American action is going to bring about at least some liberalization, some, some social and some economic freedom. If you think that democracy is going to emerge from the slaughter in Iraq, then frankly, Michael, if you forgive me saying so, you know nothing about Iraq and you know nothing about the Middle East. Iraq will atomize into a kind of Yugoslavia on top of the world's biggest oil fields. Clan against clan, family against family, sectarian group against group, nation even against nations. When the Turks invade Kurdistan, when Kurds are in Baghdad, when the Shia forces come across the border from Iran, believe me, the last thing you're going to have is democracy. You're going to have a jigsaw puzzle even more problematic than the one that exists. George Galloway meeting Saddam Hussein in 1994. Sir, I salute your courage, your strength, your indefatigability. Tonight, British servicemen and women are engaged from air, land and sea. Their mission? To remove Saddam Hussein from power and disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. States. Fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Baghdad, Saddam Hussein's regime and its buildings were laid open. On April 22, 2003, the British newspaper The Daily Telegraph published a front page story claiming documents they had recovered within the Iraqi oil ministry showed George Galloway was in the pay of Saddam Hussein. The following week, the U.S.-based Christian Science Monitor published a similar story with a second set of Iraqi documents. These documents, from both reports, were soon proven to be either forged or faked. Incontestably, there was a, an intelligence-driven dirty tricks operation against me, but against other people, too. In London, hundreds of thousands of anti-war protesters have taken to the streets. Man of the moment is anti-war MP George Galloway. Well done, George. Keep going, George. Well done, George. You are my favourite. I thought you as well. I'm not. No, I'm not. Can I? Well done, George. Keep it up. Well done, George. Well, I'm a great supporter of this. Galloway has become a hero to the anti-war movement around the world. His relentless attacks on what he calls Tony Blair's lie machine have earned him a generation of worshippers. This man should be a prime minister and kick the liars out. Kick the liars You should be a prime minister. You should be a king, you royal highness. You should be a king. To really understand George Galloway, though, you need to understand his 30-year love affair with the Middle East. Galloway describes himself as a friend of the Arab world. Beginning in 1975, when as a young man he travelled from Scotland to the Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon. I really fell head over heels with the revolution that was there the Palestinian camps, the plurality of Palestinian politics. Every, every building had a different party in it. Every party had a magazine and a newspaper. And 
there was music in the cafes at night and revolution in the air, as Bob Dylan put it in another context. And I liked uh, revolution. I was not afraid of backing an unpopular cause even then. Galloway soon had the Palestinian flag flying over the city chambers back in Dundee. It was in the mid 70s after the Munich uh, Olympic Games operation and aircraft hijackings and so on. It was, in a way, in public relations terms, it was the equivalent of saying you were with bin Laden today. I mean, you, in your, one of your books, you acknowledge a number of teachers as being very important to you, and you name them. Yes. Important times for you. Very. Uh, I, I mean, I do have my regrets that I didn't uh, um, pay attention enough in school, but nonetheless, school was very important to me. It was very important to me in developing a vocabulary, for example. I mean, one of the things I'm known for is slightly archaic sometimes, uh, but uh, interesting use of language and that came directly from my English teacher Mr. Bennett that's the way he used to talk and well, what do you mean by interesting use of language? well you know I come up with words like popinje and uh, vituperative and uh, words that are not often used and sometimes journalists arch their eyebrows as if to say what does that word mean and they're often university educated in the way that I'm not idea أن المسلمين لديهم شيء من المرض في أجسادهم ويجب علاجها وهذه الفكرة التي يجري دفعها من قبل سيد بلير وأيضا حكومة سيد برلسكوني في إيطاليا هذا ما يجب مقاومته المسلمون ليسوا مرضى المرضى هم بوش وبلير المسلمون ليسوا بحاجة للعلاج Politics is partly about being a performer. You are well known as a speaker, an orator. Did you learn those skills? You mentioned earlier the writing skills and valuing words. Did they teach you to become a per performer? No, uh, we didn't have a debating society or, or anything like that at our school. I kind of wish we had. If I were running a school, I'd certainly encourage one. Yeah. I didn't do drama, uh, though I've been in many a drama uh, <laughs> since. Two of your beautiful daughters are in the hands of foreigners. Jerusalem and Baghdad are the foreigners of Baghdad. The daughters, as they will, the daughters are crying for help, and the Arab world is silent. تصرخان طلبا للنجدة والعالم العربي صامت وبعض العالم العربي أيضا يتعاون في اغتصاب هاتين الصبيتين العربيتين والسبب السبب هو أنهم من الضعف والفساد kicked out by a kangaroo court. That's how George Galloway sees it, and the only crime he pleads guilty to is opposing an immoral and illegal war. With every bone in my body, I will fight to hold to account a lying, deceiving prime minister who cheated the party, cheated the parliament, lied to the armed forces, and lied to the parliament, and has to be held to account. Joined now by the MP, George Galloway, and by the Labour MP, Eric Joyce. George Galloway, first of all, when you told Iraqis to resist British troops, you must have known that would have been unacceptable to the Labour Party. It would be better if you got that right. No, I have got uh, it right. No, you've, got not got, you've obviously not got the transcript. I, I have. have never asked Iraqis to resist British troops. You see, just as Mr Blair took the country to war based on a lie, and the media uh, uh, marched along behind them based on a lie, I have never called on anybody to harm British troops. I'm trying to get British troops out of Iraq so nobody can harm them. I said resist. This is a, from the transcript of the Leslie Rose Show. Are you actually telling them Iraqis to resist? Of course I am. Any foreign country which is invaded illegally by foreigners has the right to, will and should defend themselves. That's an entirely different thing from what you just alleged and what the Labour Party expelled me for. They said that I called, and you repeated it today, tonight that I called on British forces to disobey orders. I didn't. I called on them to disobey illegal orders. That's their obligation under international law. We should get these things right. Eric Joyce, is it better to have George Galloway in the party or out of the party? Out. George unquestionably and disgracefully called on 
foreign mercenaries or whatever they might be called to fight with British troops. There's no question about that. He's now backpedalling in the extreme. The idea that he called on people to disobey illegal orders is just ridiculous. No British soldier would no knowingly uh, obey an illegal command. He called on foreign troops to attack British troops it was a disgrace. That You're a disgrace, a George. Show You're me simply, where. Show me where I did that. Where did I do Let that? Us watch where Abu did Dhabi. I do that? Let us watch the real where did I do that? Abu Dhabi and on the Leslie Riddick programme, which has just been quoted, it's absolutely clear Listen. what your intention was. You play with words, George, in a way you think the British yeah. public is stupid, but guess what? They're not stupid, and you're quite well, simply yeah. a disgrace for calling on foreign troops to, attra uh, to attack. British troops. Your concern for British soldiers has never been evident over the years. May I get a word I in think it's quite clear. Say, Georgia, can you absolutely clarify this point? Did you There's no need to clarify. No, it's no, in the do. transcript. It's, it's exactly There's a transcript in front of the Labour Party today on which they expelled me. In their own transcript, it's clear that I did absolutely nothing of the kind. Now, I wish you had the transcript of what I, I was expelled. That's a Leslie Riddock show from last year. Excellent. I was expelled today on the Abu Dhabi interview. And I wish you had the transcript in front of you. I have it in the dressing room in my briefcase. I wish I'd brought it. I assumed you'd be better briefed. I was expelled based on the Abu Dhabi interview. The transcript makes it abundantly clear. I did not. Have never called on anyone to attack British troops, and I have never called on British troops to disobey orders, only illegal orders. Eric Joyce appears to agree with me on that point. I think it clearly came from Tony Blair personally. He, Blair signalled it um, immediately after the fall of Baghdad that he would be moving against Galloway, um, and they were just not prepared to have that level of attack from one of their own backbenchers, and they, in, in a war that they knew was unpopular with the majority of the British people. It, it was an unprecedented thing in Labour Party history for someone to be expelled solely for an expression of opinion, which is effectively what it was. George, there's excellent standard reporting there from The Telegraph. You're a big fan of the newspaper, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'll see them in court. I had a meeting with my legal team this afternoon. Writ served? You as the editor of Private Eye must know that we can't talk about this, these kind of things on air. Can't you? No. That must be where I've gone wrong. <laughs> Part of it was that, you're, you, that you implied that you had connections to the oil industry, wasn't it? In what sense? What's this? That's an oil rig. It is. It's called the George Galloway. Uh, <laughs> it's in the Middle East at the moment. That's fantastic. You see, if the Telegraph had had that, we'd have all have believed it. <laughs> I legally have to say this, uh, that there might be a different George Galloway uh, after whom it's named, possibly. In fact, uh, he's been going around the world causing me problems all my life. That really? <laughs> And that, Your Honour, is the case for Mr. <laughs> Gallagher. This is a legal battle which began 18 months ago in the immediate aftermath of the Iraq War. On his way into court, George Galloway was typically robust about the management of the Daily Telegraph. On Iraq, I've been proved right and they've been proved wrong. And I very much hope that these proceedings this week will prove likewise. David Blair, the Telegraph journalist whose reports from Baghdad sparked this libel case. The paper insists it was right to publish the story. In April 2003, the Telegraph claimed that George Galloway was in the pay of Saddam Hussein's regime and that he received around £375,000 a year. The documents on which the Telegraph based its story were found at the Iraqi Foreign Ministry in the chaotic days which followed the war. George Galloway had a link with Iraq through an appeal he set up to help a young girl, Mariam Hansa, who was suffering from leukaemia. His legal team say that although he was trying to aid the people of Iraq, he was not a paid agent of Saddam Hussein. I'm joined now by George Galloway. Um, first of all, you've beaten the Daily Telegraph. Um, who else are you going to sue for repeating the libel, given that other papers and indeed ministers criticised you? Well, uh, let me get this one over first. It's been quite a grueling affair. I had to risk a total ruin to bring this case. If I had lost it, I would have been homeless, jobless, and penniless, and bankrupt and out of public office for good as a bankrupt. So uh, it's not a small undertaking, such a battle as this. Uh, but the victory has been, as your report has just uh, said, very comprehensive. But I have now collected uh, although I've not yet got the cash, a quarter of a million pounds in libel damages in six months from the Times, the Sunday Times, the Christian Science Monitor. So if you're in a role, you may Telegraph. as well go on. Well, I may well, uh, but I'll, if you don't mind, take my legal counsel uh, on that rather than discuss it on Newsnight. 
Um, you are the only person that's actually claimed the documents were forgeries. Do you know who forged them? Have you an idea who forged them? Well, I've claimed throughout that the documents in the Daily Telegraph case were fake. I'm not able to establish that they are forgeries. We are talking about a photocopy of a document illegibly signed, uh, citing a report from an unnamed intelligence officer uh, found miraculously in a burning building in Baghdad. Baghdad is under the control of the uh, Daily Telegraph's friends, the puppet regime. I'm not able to go there. I'm not able properly to investigate it. But I do know that the other documents in the other cases uh, were found to be forgeries, and I have no doubt that this document is a fake. So why would anyone forge this exactly? Well, you know, you can say why, but you know for a fact, because in the very same courtroom, Court 13 in the Strand at the High Court, one of the world's great newspapers, the Christian Science Monitor, was forced to pay me substantial damages and make an apology of the most groveling kind for publishing on its front page in 93 countries the allegation that I had taken 10 million... But who do you blame million. with this? Who well, do you blame the ownership or do you blame the editorial staff at the Telegraph? Well, I think the uh, provenance of the document uh, is highly contentious. I will be seeking parliamentary opportunities to discuss that matter further in the next days and weeks. One day we'll know who produced this fake document. But a very good test on these occasions is to ask who benefits, who benefited from the attempt to destroy one of the leading figures in the British anti-war movement. And when you ask that question, certain answers flash up in your mind. And I think the intelligent viewers of Newsnight can work that out for themselves. So what are you going to do with the money? Well, I haven't got it yet because the Telegraph uh, have asked uh, for uh, leave to appeal against the judge's refusal to allow them leave to appeal. Uh, it'll be t some time before uh, that's all worked out. But there is a general election coming up. I will be standing in so the, your coffer. In the uh, Bethnal Green and Bow constituency and it'll, it'll buy quite a few election leaflets. In the shadow of the city lies an area of London that's become home to a succession of immigrants, from the Huguenots in the 17th century to the Bangladeshis of today. Nearly half the population here are Muslims, and they hold the key to the constituency of Bethnal Green and Bow. Anyway, thanks for your support. Thank you. George Galloway is fighting here for the anti-war party Hi, Respect. He wants to be an East Ender now that his Glasgow Kelvin seat disappears under boundary changes. Undoubtedly, our stand, my stand, against the war and for Palestine and against Bush and Blair is particularly popular amongst uh, Muslim voters. Traditionally, Labour support here has been as solid as the Tower of London, which lies in the constituency. In 2001, the party secured a majority of over 10,000. But this Labour citadel isn't as impregnable as it first appears. Last year, in the European elections, Respect topped the poll in the borough of Tower Hamlets, which covers over half of the constituency of Bethnal Green and Bow. The party also won a council seat nearby. Certainly nothing you could describe as a rout, but enough of a breach in the defences here to get Labour strategists worried. Oh, thank you for that hug. Do I get that for free? If only all the voters in Bethnal Green and Bow were this supportive of their MP. Una King backed the war and it could cost her dearly. But she stresses what Labour has done for Muslims in her constituency. The Muslim community has one of the lowest income levels, for example. Therefore, the measures we're taking to reduce poverty and to give people the education they deserve, that sort of thing, helps the Muslim community. And then there are the specific measures. We've outlawed uh, discrimination on the grounds of religion in the workplace, things that really affect my constituents who are Muslims. So the point is, I think it would be misleading to assume that this election is about one issue. The Muslim Association of Britain believes that Muslim voters could influence the result in up to 50 constituencies and Bethnal Green and Bow is one of five Labour seats where Muslims will have the greatest chance of deciding who wins. This is a George Galloway press conference for the benefit of the Bengali media but his political opponents claim he's just using the Muslim vote to further his own career. I think he's an opportunist and he's a stranger in this area. He was never ever seen by the voters in this area and suddenly after the Iraq war 
He's coming all the way from Glasgow, Kevin, to this area, I think, to use this community. Galway Khan represent our community because he don't know nothing about our community. He just come to divide our boards. Like any section of the electorate, Muslim voters will consider a range of issues before deciding who to support. But unquestionably, the war has harmed Labour. Ministers have soothing words for Muslims on this, but will that be enough to shore up support here? Mark Sanders, BBC News, East London. Colonel James Marshall Andrews asks you this. Would you rather Saddam was still in power? No, of course not. I was against the dictatorship in Iraq when you didn't want to know about it. I was against the dictatorship in Saudi Arabia, and you still don't want to know about it. The dictatorships in the Middle East are only there because they're backed by Britain and the United States. Let's have a try and see if we get Leela back. Leela, are you there? And can yes, you ask I am. your question again? Off you go. Okay, basically, um, how can any voter trust you, Mr. Galloway? Um, you're a loose cannon. You've been a lifelong member of the Labour Party, which basically chucked you out. Um, I know you've got a 50 page manifesto. But basically, it's a single issue uh, um, party. And uh, another question basically is even if the 16 members, your candidates, actually get through, how are you actually going to deliver your manifesto pledges, like renationalization of railways? I think it's fantasy land. You're in, well, Mr. Galloway. It would again be good if uh, the people that you've set up for this program had their facts right. For a start, our manifesto isn't 50 pages. We're not standing 16 candidates. We're standing almost double that number of candidates. We're not standing in Scotland, so why have you got a voter on from Scotland? I just explain. I'll yeah. tell you why you've got a voter on from Scotland. Go because on. you couldn't find a voter in the constituency I am standing in that would come on to the television to attack me. This is I'm a sorry, setup. Mr. Galloway. Everybody watching just this program, although thankfully, just a minute, thankfully there are not that many, every person watching this program now knows that this is a setup. It's a waste of your viewers' time, it's a waste of your professional time, and it's a waste of my time, Can because I I'm actually involved in, in an just, election. Just, just hang on a moment, I, I, well over a million people, quite a lot of people. Leila, did you want to come back? You were trying to I break did in indeed. I'm, I'm quite incensed with Mr. Galloway saying that this is set up. I'm a floating voter. Uh, I'm wanting you're to not be floating easily Wait a minute, let her speak. Okay. Come on. Sorry, Leila, carry on. Right. You Basically, I feel this. Uh, I'm really incensed with this uh, uh, allegation that it's a setup. I'm a floating voter. Uh, he can't hold it against me that I'm a Scot. I want to be well informed about what is happening down south. It is the UK general election, Mr. Galloway. It is not just in Scotland. No, so I'd like I'm to not. have your views as well, clearly as possible. We are not. Uh, we are not standing in Scotland, so it's not a UK general election for us. And you knew that when you found a Scot to go on the television to attack me. Rob, a floating Rob voter, a floating vote. Well, I'm attacking Rob, Rob, you. Shall we answer some of the questions from our viewers, well, many of well, which echoed this is, the sentiment of Mr. Galloway? We should do, because this is... single issue party, and therefore do. not that relevant. Well, we should do, because this is the very last time I'll be speaking to ITN. Be sure about that. So let's go on and answer some of your other questions. We've got m many, I many of them are... Uh, well, I just don't know where to start. They're all <laughs> much the same. Well, no wonder they are, way. because you've set this whole thing up. No, we've not set it up. There are millions of people. There are millions. No, you are You've been trailing this program of me as an admirer of Saddam Hussein, which I'm not. You've put on a voter from Scotland well, where we're not we standing, where we don't exist, to attack me. That's and now you're telling me you've got a shoal of hostile questions. Many. There are millions of people. Let's Millions of people support our stand on the war on Iraq and our stand on railways and on many other issues. And you're going to get a surprise on Thursday when you see the result in the constituency that's in which I'm standing. But you won't be talking to me after it. Let me assure you of that. Shahagir backed Farouk, the Conservative Party candidate, 6,244. <laughs> John Patrick William Foster, the Green Party candidate, 1,950. George Galloway, respect, 15,801. Una Tamsin King, the Labour Party candidate, 14,978. Celia Pugh, Celia Pugh, 
Julia Pugh, 38. The total number of ballot papers rejected was 244. And I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly elected a member of Parliament for Bethnal Green Mr. Blair, this is for Iraq. This defeat that you have suffered and all the other defeats that New Labour has suffered this evening is for Iraq. All the people you killed, all the lies you told have come back to haunt you. And the best thing the Labour Party could do is sack you tomorrow morning as soon as they get back for what? Well, we're joined now uh, from his count in uh, Bethnal Green and Bow by George Galloway. Mr. Galloway, are you proud of having got rid of one of the very few black women in Parliament? What a preposterous question. I know it's very late in the night, but wouldn't you be better by starting by congratulating me for one of the most sensational election results in modern history? Are you proud of having got rid of one of the very few black women uh, in Parliament? I'm not, Jeremy, move on to your next question. Well, you're not answering that one. No, because I don't believe that people get elected because of the colour of their skin. I believe people get elected because of their record and because of their policies. So you, move on to your next question. Are you Because proud? I've got a lot of people who want to speak to me. Uh, you if, you ask that, if you ask that question again, I'm going. I warn you now. Don't try and threaten me, Mr. Galloway, you're please. The who, you're the one who's trying to badger me. I'm not now, trying to mind, badger you. I'm merely asking I've whether you're got, proud of having, having driven got, out of Parliament one of the very few black women there, a woman you accused of having on her conscience the deaths of 100,000 people. Oh, well, there's no doubt about that one. There's absolutely no doubt that all those new Labour MPs who voted for Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush's war have on their hands the blood of 100,000 people in Iraq, many of them British soldiers, many of them American soldiers, most of them Iraqis. And that's a more uh, important issue absolutely. than and the you, colour you of went, her skin. Uh, uh, yes, because you. you then went on to say, including a lot of women who had blacker faces than her. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So don't try and uh, tell me that I should feel guilty about one of the most sensational election results in modern electoral history because I the person I defeated is a Nick woman or has Nick Rainsford had you to a T when he said you were a demagogue. I'm sorry? Nick Rainsford. You know who I mean? Nick Rainsford, Labour MP? No, no, I don't know. No, you've never heard of him? I've never heard of Nick Rainsford, no. What else haven't you heard of? <laughs> well, I've been in Parliament a he long time. He was a time. parliamentary colleague of yours until well, very recently. M most of them just blend one into the other, Jeremy. They're, 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 they're largely a spineless, a supine bunch. Have you ever and, heard uh, of Tony Banks? Yes, I have, yes. Right, Tony Banks was sitting here five minutes ago and he said that you were behaving inexcusably. You had deliberately well, chosen to go to that part of London and to exploit the latent racial tensions there. Well, you are actually conducting one of the most, even by your standards, one of the most absurd interviews I have ever participated in. I have just won an election. Can you find it within yourself? To recognise that fact, to recognise the fact that the people of Bethnal Green and Bow chose me this evening. Why are we recognising? Why are you insulting them? I'm, not, insulting ins I'm them? not insulting them. Yes, I'm not are. insulting you. You are insulting them. They chose me just a few minutes ago. Can't you find it within yourself even to congratulate me on this victory? Congratulations, Mr. Thank Galloway. You very much How do you propose to Thank use you your time in? Oh, I see. It's no, another no. occasion of you no, not no, wanting no, to talk no, to no. someone who doesn't no, agree no, with no, you. No. Actually, Jeremy. I said on the day that I was expelled that Mr. Blair would rue the day that he expelled me, and he's already rued it. Um, we are the only credible challenge from the left to Labour that has existed in this country for 60 years. Indeed, I'm the only Member of Parliament ever to have been elected to the left of Labour for 60 years. <laughs> The glare of public scrutiny has again fallen on the UN. Its oil for food program was designed to help the neediest in Iraq, but has been accused by US senators of being one of history's biggest frauds. This hearing the permanent subcommittee investigations is called to order. 
Now, this investigation by Congress has concluded that Saddam Hussein gave vouchers to buy Iraqi oil in exchange for influence and support. One of those named as a recipient of those vouchers is George Galloway, the new MP for Bethnal Green and Bow. For years, he campaigned to get the Iraq sanctions lifted. Now he's accused of getting options from the former regime to buy 20 million barrels of the country's oil. In a strongly worded report, the committee says there is significant evidence that George Galloway was allocated millions of barrels of crude oil under the Oil for Food program. The senators have looked at documents from the Iraqi Ministry of Oil and spoken to senior officials in Saddam Hussein's government, including the former vice president. Last month, he told the committee that Mr. Galloway was allocated oil because of his opinions about Iraq and because he wanted to lift the embargo against Iraq. The former French interior minister is also accused of receiving vouchers for millions of barrels of oil, a charge he's already rejected. George Galloway's also issued a strong denial, saying, I have written and emailed repeatedly asking for the opportunity to appear before the committee to provide evidence and rebut their assumptions, and they have yet to respond. I have never traded in a barrel of oil or any vouchers for it. Last year, he won substantial damages after the Daily Telegraph accused him of being an agent of Saddam Hussein. George Galloway calls the latest charges Groundhog Day. Ian Panel, BBC News, Washington. Mr. Galloway, I'm pleased to have you before the committee today. What I'm going to do is, is briefly summarize the evidence before I give you a chance to uh, give your, your sworn testimony. Uh, the oil for food program was used to support those who were favorable to Iraq. Former Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz and Iraqi Vice President Taha Yasin Ramadan confirmed this. I would think that you would admit that your efforts to oppose the sanction were well received by the regime. Uh, I know it's been quoted to you many, many times, but your, I would say, infamous uh, uh, statement to uh, uh, Saddam Hussein on January 21st, 1994, uh, where uh, you said to uh, uh, Saddam, Your Excellency, Mr. President, I greet you in the name of many thousands of people in Britain who stood against the tide and opposed the war and aggression against Iraq, continue to oppose the war by economic means, which is aimed to strangle the light out of the great people, life of the great people of Iraq. Uh, you went on, uh, ultimately, at the very end, to say, Sir, I salute your courage, your strength, your indefatigability, and I want you to know that we are with you, and I believe it was in Arabic, Hata al Nasa, Hat al Nasa, Hat al Quds, which means uh, until victory, until victory in Jerusalem. And I also would note that you have stated that you deeply regret uh, those comments and that the, uh, the comments were not aimed directly at Saddam, but they were aimed at the Iraqi people. Uh, we have your name in Iraqi documents, some prepared before the fall of Saddam, some after that identify you as one of the allocation holders, that your allocations were then used by Fawaz Zerkat operations on, operating under the name of Iridium Petroleum and the Middle East Advanced Semiconductor to actually lift the oil. We know, too, based on the statements of former Iraqi officials as well as some documents, and in the cases of Vladimir Janowski and Alexander Volshin, correspondence and documents, that allocation holders knew that surcharges or oil allocations were paid to Saddam Hussein, that allocation holders were aware of this and responsible for the payments. We have also heard testimony regarding several documents retrieved from the Iraqi oil, oil ministry, Iraqi Ministry of Oil, that demonstrate how Iraqi, uh, Iraq allocated oil to its friends and allies. Exhibit 13, which you've seen, displayed a somewhat chart that demonstrated Vladimir Zhinovsky's dealing with Machino Import in Phase 11. That chart also lists contract M1104 with Middle East Advanced Semiconductor. Exhibit 45, her testimony regarding a SOMO chart entitled Crude Oil Allocations During Phase 9 of the Memorandum of Understanding that indicates contract M923 was executed between SOMO and Mr. Farwez Zorakat slash George Galloway slash Iridium Petroleum. Exhibit 9, we also heard testimony regarding a memo from the Executive Director of SOMO to the Oil Minister requesting approval of contract M923. The document includes an official Ministry of Oil stamp dated 115-2001 and provides details of the contract M923 signed with Iridium Petroleum Company Perens for Waz Zurichet Dash Miriam's Appeal, indicating that the allocation recipient for contract M923 was for Waz Zurichet Miriam's Appeal. Uh, Mr. Galloway, as I indicated in my opening statement, this is not a court of law. This committee has simply made available information obtained during the investigation from interviews of former Iraqi officials, as well as Iraqi documents that lay out how the oil for food program worked. 
how allocations were given to favored friends, how allocation holders made substantial commissions on those allocations to oil companies, what Ramadan called compensation for support, what another official, when talking about another allocation holder, said, of course they made a profit, that's the whole point, how surcharges on oil contracts were given back to the Saddam regime and were the responsibility of the allocation holder. The evidence and clearly identifies you as an allocation beneficiary who transferred the allocations to Fawaz Zurichat, who became chairman of your organization, Miriam's Appeal. Appeal. Senior Iraqi officials have confirmed that you, in fact, received oil allocations and that the documents that identify you as an allocation recipient are valid. If you can help provide any evidence that challenges the veracity of these documents or of the statements of former Iraqi officials, we'd welcome that input. Mr. Galloway, you are appearing before the subcommittee without asserting any privilege or immunity. Indeed, your appearance before the subcommittee is entirely voluntary and on your own accord. No subpoena was issued to secure your appearance. You are appearing before the subcommittee concerning matters that do not arise out of the performance of any of your official duties as a member of the British Parliament, but instead concern actions taken by you in your capacity as a private citizen. Before we begin, pursuant to Rule 6, all witnesses who testify before the subcommittee are required to be sworn. This time I would ask you to rise and please raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. We will be using a timing system today, uh, Mr. Galloway. Uh, we could have 10 minutes for opening statement. If you need more time, we'll certainly accommodate that, and uh, you may proceed. Senator, I am not now, nor have I ever been, an oil trader. And neither has anyone on my behalf. I have never seen a bottle of oil, owned one, bought one, sold one, and neither has anybody on my behalf. Now, I know that standards have slipped over the last few years in Washington, but for a lawyer, you're remarkably cavalier with any idea of justice. I'm here today, but last week, you already found me guilty. You traduced my name around the world without ever having asked me a single question, without ever having contacted me, without ever having written to me or telephoned me, without any contact with me whatsoever. And you call that justice. Now, I want to deal with the pages that relate to me in this dossier, and I want to point out areas where there are, let's be charitable and say, errors. And then I want to put this in the context that I believe it ought to be. On the very first page of your document about me, you assert that I have had many meetings with Saddam Hussein. This is false. I have had two meetings with Saddam Hussein, once in 1994 and once in August of 2002. By no stretch of the English language can that be described as many meetings with Saddam Hussein. As a matter of fact, I've met Saddam Hussein exactly the same number of times as Donald Rumsfeld met him. The difference is, Donald Rumsfeld met him to sell him guns and to give him maps, the better to target those guns. I met him to try and bring about an end to sanctions, suffering, and war. And on the second of the two occasions, I met him to try and persuade him to allow Dr. Hans Blix and the United Nations weapons inspectors back into the country, a rather better use of two meetings with Saddam Hussein than your own Secretary of State for Defense made of his. In the same opening paragraph, you assert that I was an outspoken supporter of the Hussein regime. This is false. I have brought along here a dossier, a dossier for all the members of your committee of statements by me as late, as early rather, as the 15th of March, 1990, in which I condemn the Saddam Hussein dictatorship in the most withering terms. 
a stance I have taken since around about the time you were an anti-Vietnam War demonstrator. I was an opponent of Saddam Hussein when British and American governments and businessmen were selling him guns and gas. I used to demonstrate outside the Iraqi embassy when British and American officials were going in and out doing commerce. You will see from the official parliamentary record, Hansard, from the 15th of March 1990 onwards, voluminous evidence that I have a rather better record of opposition to Saddam Hussein than you do and than any member of the British or American governments do. Now you say in this document, you quote a source, you have the gall to quote a source without ever having asked me if the allegation from the source was true, that I am, quote, the owner of a company which has made substantial profits from trading in Iraqi oil. Senator, I do not own any companies beyond a small company whose entire purpose, whose sole purpose, is to receive the income from my journalistic earnings from my employer, Associated Newspapers in London. I do not own a company that's been trading in Iraqi oil. And you had no business to carry a quotation, utterly unsubstantiated and false, implying otherwise. Now, you have nothing on me, Senator, except my name on lists of names from Iraq, many of which have been drawn up after the installation of your puppet government in Baghdad. If you had any of the letters against me that you had against Zhirinovsky and even Pasqua, they would have been up there in your slideshow for the members of your committee today. You have my name on lists provided to you by the Dolfer inquiry, provided to him by the convicted bank robber and fraudster and con man Ahmed Chalabi, who many people, to their credit in your country, now realize played a decisive role in leading your country into the disaster in Iraq. There were 270 names on that list originally. That's somehow been filleted down to the names you chose to deal with in this committee. Some of the names on that committee included the former secretary to His Holiness Pope John Paul II, the former head of the African National Congress Presidential Office, and many others who had one defining characteristic in common. They all stood against the policy of sanctions and war which you vociferously prosecuted and which has led us to this disaster. You quote Mr. Taha Yassin Ramadan. Well, you have something on me. I've never met Mr. Taha Yassin Ramadan. Your subcommittee apparently has. But I do know that he's your prisoner. I believe he's in Abu Ghraib prison. I believe he's facing war crimes, charges, punishable by death. In these circumstances, knowing what the world knows about how you treat prisoners in Abu Ghraib prison, in Bagram Air Base, in Guantanamo Bay, including, I may say, British citizens being held in those places. I'm not sure how much credibility anyone would put on anything you managed to get from a prisoner in those circumstances. But you quote 13 words from Taha Yassin Ramadan, whom I have never met. If he said what he said, then he is wrong. And if you had any evidence that I had ever engaged in any actual oil transaction, if you had any evidence that anybody ever gave me any money, it would be before the public and before this commitment today. Because I agreed with your Mr. Greenblatt. Your Mr. Greenblatt was absolutely correct. What counts is not the names on the paper. What counts is where's the money, Senator. 
Who paid me hundreds of thousands of dollars of money? The answer to that is nobody. And if you had anybody who ever paid me a penny, you would have produced them here today. Now you refer at length to a company named in these documents as Eredio Petroleum. I say to you under oath here today, I have never heard of this company. I have never met anyone from this company. This company has never paid a penny to me. And I'll tell you something else. I can assure you that a radio petroleum has never paid a single penny to the Mariam Appeal campaign. Not a thin dime. I don't know who a radio petroleum are, but I dare say if you were to ask them, they would confirm that they have never met me or ever paid me a penny. Whilst I'm on that subject, who is this senior former regime official that you spoke to yesterday? Don't you think I have a right to know? Don't you think the committee and the public have a right to know who this senior former regime official you were quoting against me interviewed yesterday actually is? Now, one of the most serious of the mistakes that you have made in this set of documents is, to be frank, such a schoolboy howler as to make a fool of the efforts that you have made. You assert on page 19, not once, but twice, that the documents that you're referring to cover a different period in time from the documents covered by the Daily Telegraph, which were the subject of a libel action won by me in the High Court in England late last year. You state that the Daily Telegraph article cited documents from 1992 and 1993, whilst you are dealing with documents dating from 2001. Senator, the Daily Telegraph's documents date identically to the documents that you are dealing with in your report here. None of the Daily Telegraph's documents dealt with a period of 1992-1993. I had never set foot in Iraq until late in 1993. Never in my life. There could possibly be no documents relating to oil for food matters in 1992-93, for the oil for food scheme did not exist at that time. And yet, you've allocated a full section of this document to claiming that your documents are from a different era to the Daily Telegraph documents when the opposite is true. Your documents and the Daily Telegraph documents deal with exactly the same period. But perhaps you were confusing the Daily Telegraph action with the Christian Science Monitor. The Christian Science Monitor did indeed publish on its front pages a set of allegations against me very similar to the ones that your committee have made. They did indeed rely on documents which started in 1992, 1993. These documents were unmasked by the Christian Science Monitor themselves as forgeries. Now, the neocon websites and newspapers in which you're such a hero, Senator, were all absolutely cock-a-hoop at the publication of the Christian Science Monitor documents. They were all absolutely convinced of their authenticity. They were all absolutely convinced that these documents showed me receiving 10 million dollars from the Saddam Hussein regime. And they were all lies. In the same week as the Daily Telegraph published their documents against me, the Christian Science Monitor published theirs, which turned out to be forgeries. And the British newspaper Mail on Sunday 
purchased a third set of documents, which also on forensic examination turned out to be forgeries. So there's nothing fanciful about this. Nothing at all fanciful about it. The existence of forged documents implicating me in commercial activities with the Iraqi regime is a proven fact. It's a proven fact that these forged documents existed and were being circulated amongst right-wing newspapers in Baghdad and around the world in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Iraqi regime. Now, Senator, I gave my heart and soul to oppose the policy that you promoted. I gave my political life's blood to try to stop the mass killing of Iraqis by the sanctions on Iraq, which killed a million Iraqis, most of them children. Most of them died before they even knew that they were Iraqis, but they died for no other reason other than that they were Iraqis, with the misfortune to be born at that time. I gave my heart and soul to stop you committing the disaster that you did commit in invading Iraq. And I told the world that your case for the war was a pack of lies. I told the world that Iraq, contrary to your claims, did not have weapons of mass destruction. I told the world, contrary to your claims, that Iraq had no connection to Al-Qaeda. I told the world, contrary to your claims, that Iraq had no connection to the atrocity on 9-11-2001. I told the world, contrary to your claims, that the Iraqi people would resist a British and American invasion of their country and that the fall of Baghdad would not be the beginning of the end, but merely the end of the beginning. Senator, in everything I said about Iraq, I turned out to be right and you turned out to be wrong. And 100,000 people have paid with their lives, 1,600 of them American soldiers sent to their deaths on a pack of lies, 15,000 of them wounded, many of them disabled forever on a pack of lies. If the world had listened to Kofi Annan, whose dismissal you demanded, if the world had listened to President Chirac, who you want to paint as some kind of corrupt traitor, if the world had listened to me and the anti-war movement in Britain, we would not be in the disaster that we are in today. Senator, this is the mother of all smoke screens. You are trying to divert attention from the crimes that you supported, from the theft of billions of dollars of Iraq's wealth. Have a look at the real oil for food scandal. Have a look at the 14 months you were in charge of Baghdad, the first 14 months, when $8.8 .8 billion of Iraq's wealth went missing on your watch. Have a look at Halliburton and the other American corporations that stole not only Iraq's money, but the money of the American taxpayer. Have a look at the oil that you didn't even meter, that you were shipping out of the country and selling, the proceeds of which went who knows where. Have a look at the $800 million you gave to American military commanders to hand out around the country without even counting it or weighing it. Have a look at the real scandal breaking in the newspapers today, revealed in the earlier testimony in this committee that the biggest sanctions busters were not me or Russian politicians or French politicians. The real sanctions busters were your own companies with the connivance of your own government.
lost my voice. <laughs> but uh, you're welcome to me when I came through the doors. Earlier this evening is something I will never, ever forget, and I want to thank you for the now, over your career, I think it's fair to say you've sometimes been a bit of a controversial figure. Um, do you think this has anything to do with the way the press has painted a picture of you? Um, in other words, would you call yourself a victim of media manipulation? Well, you know, as uh, someone once said, uh, for a political figure to complain about the media is like a ship's captain complaining about the sea. Yeah. Uh, you just have to sail across as best you can, however troubled the waters are. And that's what I've tried to do, with some success. And it's because it's been with some success that some sections of the media hate me even more virulently than they would hate someone else with my point of view. Um, I just have to accept that as a kind of bizarre compliment, I think. Nothing is true until it has been officially denied. Yes. <laughs> and it is your duty when confronted with the state making decisions of enormous importance to pursue those running the country with at least half of the energy that you pursued me over these last few years. waiting for someone to speak the truth. <laughs> 